Sure. So uh, as I mentioned before, this is really a, a horse race of technology. And um, unfortunately, part of war is, is economics. And some, I, I would say all countries don't have the uh, luxurious $500 billion to spend on defense as the U.S. does. So if we're making it a, a directed, um, a directed energy uh, investment, and there's going to be a tipping point, if we can prove from the U.S. standpoint that this is something worth investing in and worth purchasing, there's going to be a Me Too strategy, uh, specifically among, our, uh, uh, among the nations that we're friendly with. So from the standpoint of other nations buying it, we'll probably end up, you know, as long as it can pass um, uh, regulations, you could have countries, like you said, like Israel, like Great Britain, uh, like Australia, you know, using a similar technology to essentially augment the capabilities, um, augment the capabilities, capabilities they already have. Now, from the other side of it, you have China and Russia that are absolutely investing in directed energy solid state lasers right now because they see what we are doing uh, on our end. And what it's doing is it's essentially flipping the economics. Right now, China sees the way to defeat us as essentially just surge, mass, and numbers. But if we can flip that equation from the standpoint of we will not run out of missiles if they shoot their own missiles at us, then that changes the way they fight. So it's almost an incremental, you know, it's, it really ends up being an arms race. It ends up being a, well, if we have this, then they'll have to have something similar to actually counter it because then their uh, initial their initial tactics will not work on our ships or aircraft if we were able to counter it with lasers. Um, the leadership in Washington sees lasers as really a way to, to tip the scales for us, um, specifically from a numbers standpoint. So there's uh, direct energy champions across the war fighting community um, that are really buying into directed energy. And what you mentioned before, what could it do from a geopolitical standpoint? Well, it'll actually change the way I think from an aerospace and defense community, what those companies, what they'll be making, you might have a, a more of a focus on lasers, or you might have a focus on ways to counter lasers. You think about it, if we start implementing lasers, there's two things the enemy could do. They could either start you know, doing something in parity, or they could start hardening up their missiles or hardening up their UAVs that reflect the laser or repel the laser. So you could have some incremental jump in their UAV or their rocket technology when thinking about how to counter uh, counter the lasers that we will implement in our, uh, uh, in our assets. So that's, that's one side. The other side is once other countries start adapting and um, adopting the laser itself, you'll start having, uh, as you said, Pakistan and India, you'll start having near-peer competitors being able to essentially counter themselves. So it won't actually make too much of a difference in terms of how they are geopolitically, but how they act as a nation uh, it will be uh, it will be different, and I will say I'm I'm fairly skeptical in terms of technology. And the last couple of years, a lot of people have been talking about lasers and how they'll be adopted. But I really believe we're at a tipping point now, where you have the right amount of investment, you have the right amount of buy-in from the right customers, both within the U.S. and from a threat perspective. You have China and Russia building it, so we almost have no choice but to invest in lasers and. For the next couple of years, uh, I believe, we believe actually that at Addison that we'll see a sustained uh, growth, sustained more than previous cycles due to successful field testing and increasing uh, urgent operational needs. 